as Mark said, is, is on steel and nickel alloys, basically FCC components, but obviously there are other phases in there. Uh, and we'll talk about some of these, uh, the BCC and the uh, HCP uh, from Martin transformations. And, and because this, you have dual phase alloys as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about nuclear applications of stainless steel by introduction, a little bit of physical metallurgy to set the scene so you understand some of the processes and uh, and then we'll get on to radiation effects, which is the interesting stuff. Um, I'm not going to cover all of the effects of radiation, such as stress corrosion cracking or sorry, radiation assisted stress corrosion cracking, um, but I will touch on, I will allude to some of that, the findings on those aspects and certainly the ductile to brittle transition temperature, which is something more specific to ferritic steels. But I will talk about more specifically radiation hardening, strain localization, and irradiation embrittlement. So, oh, why is this not advancing? Admit. Oh, maybe I, I've just admitted Mardi. So, okay. So just to um, illustrate what I mean um, when I'm when we're talking about different types of alloys, I've got a the iron, chrome, nickel ternary at 400 degrees C here, just to illustrate where we where we are for different alloys that you may have heard about. And what what I've done here. Um, is we have the different prominent phases outlined, uh, certainly up towards the iron, 100% uh, iron phase, which is low carbon and low alloy steels. Um, the red area here demarcates the alpha phase, which is a BCC. The green area is um, a duplex kind of structures. You get a little bit of mixture of alpha and gamma, and gamma being the FCC, alpha being the BCC, um, and that's primarily at alpha and, and gamma, although when you get some martensitic transformations, you can get some hexagonal phases produced uh, also. Um, just to help understand things a little bit more, is, uh, what I've done here is just put a dotted line showing which side of the, uh, the the line we we typically talk about stainless steels and stainless steels have a chromium content which is greater than 11 or 12 percent it uh, depends on which which publication you you read uh, the most common alloys used in in reactors are the 304 and 316 and they they sit here they straddle the um, alpha alpha plus gamma boundary but well, they're primarily alpha, sorry, gamma alloys, but there's a little bit of, of um, alpha as well. Um, this blue dotted line indicates where one typically calls an alloy a nickel alloy. So anything over depends, again, depends on the publication or the textbook you might hear 28% or 30%, but anything over that 28, 30% barrier is classed as a nickel alloy, and here's a bunch of nickel alloys here I've outlined, uh, and their compositions, approximate compositions. So this is approximate, of course, because we're only dealing with three elements, and some of these alloys have um, five, six, seven, eight constituents, minor constituents, molybdenum, niobium, aluminum, this sort of thing. Um, so the, the main uh, stainless, stainless, steel, which is basically this side of the line, which is which has properties which are which are very similar to the nickel alloys is, is A286. And this is used in fuel assemblies in, in light water reactors. So the 300 series shown here, um, for those of you familiar with the Candu reactor, you'll know that the end fittings are made with 403 stainless steel. Um, I think the Koreans used 406 stainless steel. Uh, and what's rising in, in prominence in the last few years is this other alloy, this other ferritic stainless steel, which is HD9. Um, and that's got uh, a number of applications in Gen 4 reactors. 
OK, so I'll be talking about mostly uh, these alloys today, the, the, the mostly the, the steels, but but some of the uh, but also talking about nickel alloys. Um, Inconel X750 is way down here. It's a, it's a higher nickel content um, and that is used in candy reactors, as we'll see. And that high nickel content introduces some unusual and interesting properties to the material in a radiation environment. So, um, oh, I have to take a step back here. The, um, here's a diagram, schematic diagram showing um, co different components in a PWR reactor. I've circled in red in terms of the, uh, the main core components in the core and close to the core. But when it comes to the, sorry, and, and these are the stainless steels now. And in terms of the internals and the uh, reactor pressure vessel cladding, so you have this ferritic stainless steel, which is the pressure vessel, which is, I don't know, four inches thick or something like that. And there's a thin cladding layer on the inside, which is stainless steel. And that um, helps protect the, the vessel itself from corrosion. Um, um, there are other purposes as well, and which I'm not too sure about, but it certainly helps uh, to have that internal cladding. And that's it's typically um, a 309 stainless steel. Um, but austenitic steels, including nickel alloys, they are also used in the dissimilar metal wells um, where one is making the transition between the external piping and um, housings to the pressure vessel. And what I've also highlighted here in green uh, are where nickel alloys are used. So there's X750 here. That's mostly in, um, certainly in the PWR case, in the uh, in the fuel uh, fuel bun fuel assemblies um, in the springs. But Inconel 718 is also used, and I don't see it on this plot. Nope. Uh, again, this is a BWR now, same, same deal. We have a whole bunch of um, austenitic stainless steels in use in the core region, and a little bit of nickel alloys. I guess somebody was, was sensible in a way in that they realized how uh, difficult nickel, high nickel alloys can be um, in a reactor environment. Not so bad for light water reactors because the thermal neutron flux is, is low. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that um, as we go on. So again, the, the internals and the reactor pressure vessel cladding are mostly austenitic stainless steels, but there are um, other parts of the reactor, uh, control rod, um, drive mechanisms, housings, springs, internals, uh, which are nickel alloys, which are shown here in green. Uh, moving on, I'm, I'm kind of glossing over this, doing it rather quickly because you can look this up anytime, look it up on the internet, um, find out about it. I'm just putting it down just to so that there's a reference here. Um, so here's common alloys which are used in um, candy reactors. And the main ones of interest, uh, as you will see, are the, the, we have three or four stainless steel and 316. I'm not sure whether 316 is used, but 304 is certainly used for the Clandia vessel, um, primarily the Clandia vessel. And the 403, and, and 410 stainless steel is used for, uh, the 4, 403 in particular is used for the end fittings. So just to show what's going on in the candy reactor, uh, apart from the use of the steels, um, which we are identified here in the, in the candy reactor, most of the internal structure in the candy reactor, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I guess I'll use this. Uh, Pointer. Most of the internals are made from zirconium alloys. As I'm sure all of you know, 
the reason that the candy reactor focuses so strongly uh, in having structural components made from zirconium alloys is because it runs on natural uranium. Running on natural uranium, you ha it needs all the help it can get, the fuel to, <laughs> to fission, and therefore um, you, the designers are, as much as possible, try to avoid parasitic uh, absorption of thermal neutrons, the ones that would help with the fission process. So most of the internals in the candy reactor, most of the structural internals are made from zirconium alloys because zirconium has a very low neutron, thermal neutron capture cross-section. But there are specialist components. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of why springs are particularly um, why, sorry, I should say why nickel alloys are particularly good spring material, but nickel alloys are particularly good spring material. And at one time back in the 1980s, it was a, a big concern about having stretch springs or springs that were not would not stay in place. Um, and around about the time of building Bruce 8 reactor, a decision was made to to get the best damp spring material they could find <laughs> and damn the um, the parasitic absorption, and they put on. They then introduced into the reactor design for for Bruce Eight and any future reactors uh, Inconel X750. Uh, so the thing with Inconel X750 is that it degrades during time operation in the reactor, and so it is a potential life limiting um, component. Inconel 600 is another high nickel alloy. It's used in flux detectors. And these things fall apart after about five or six years, but who cares? You know, you can take them out, replace them. Um, there are also Inconel tensioning springs uh, that use, uh, that help um, support guide, guide tubes that go through the reactor core. The guide tubes themselves will be zircaloy, but the, the springs that keep them from Shaking um, are typically uh, in canal, and these are installed at the at the base of the reactor, and in this case, outside of the core. But because there's still a high thermal neutron flux in this region, there are some very interesting uh, features or interesting processes that go on that affect the springs. When it comes to these springs here on the on the core at the outside of the core. The main concern there is stress relaxation because they are springs, they're supposed to maintain some tension. Um, and if they relax, you're not going to have that retained tension. For for these springs on the, uh, the in the surrounding the pressure tube, the spaces, those springs, um, it's more the mechanical properties is the biggest concern as opposed to stress relaxation. So here's all the zirconium alloy components that are used in the candy reactor. And as I said, if I can move forward, uh, the calandia vessel itself is made from three or four stainless steel, and the enfidics are made with a ferritic martensitic um, four or three stain stainless steel. Uh, wouldn't be complete if I didn't touch on the fast reactors. So in fast reactors, we have um, most of the most of the components and certainly most of the structural materials are made from stainless steels. Um, but we do have some ferritic stainless steels. Again, it's always stainless in this case. We could have that high chrome content to prevent corrosion, especially at high temperatures. So um, that just gives you a summary of, of where the uh, how the steels are used. Different steels are used in different reactors. Oh. I forgot. Yeah, there are there are especially in the, in the UK they started to use um, nickel alloys in some of their fuel cladding. P sixteen is a mnemonic. Um, it's still a when I say it's a mnemonic, that's a it's more of a trade term. Um, but P sixteen has has gamma prime precipitates in it just the same as in Canal X750. So it's similar kind of pre precipitation hardened alloy, uh, similar to um, in Canal X750 and in Canal 718. 
So we're going to stick with stainless steels for, for now. Um, and I'm going to talk about some physical metallurgy of stainless steels. And I'm picking on things that are of value and of interest as it relates to their operation in the reactor. So this is a Schaeffler diagram and it shows, you know what? I just realized, Mark, I didn't hit the record button. Although That's okay. I think I am recording it. Yeah, I, I, I hit it. Apparently. Sorry, Mark. I said I, I was uh, I hit the record button because apparently oh. I, I was able to so start it. Oh, OK. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. <laughs> Well, well, we'll keep that going. Um, we'll find out who gets who gets whether whether I think the uh, the recorded lecture will go on Queen's the OneDrive anyway, because this is coming from from the Queen's OneDrive. This whole lecture, so we should be able to get access both to the to the um, PowerPoint and also the recording. Perfect. Well, thank you for that, Mark. That's that's thinking. I wasn't thinking. This is a Schaeffler diagram, and um, what it basically, all you need to know is that what it basically does, it, it, it it's, it's an indication for different types of steels or, or nickel alloys, if you like, or iron chrome nickel alloys, uh, what phases you're likely to get in a weld. It was primarily put together for, for welders, and they needed to know um, for various reasons how much of each different phase you'd get in the in the melted zone so you melt the alloy and then when it cools this gives you an idea of how much of the different phases one could expect depending on this composition chromium equivalent or nickel green so chromium equivalent here being the the body the um, the alpha stabilizer alpha stabilizing elements and the nickel equivalent here being the the gamma stabilizing the FCC. So this this stabilizes the BCC phase and this stabilizes the FCC phase. So you see where 304 and 316 stainless steel sit and they have about 5% of the BCC phase um, by, by nature. So one expects to see some BCC phase. So what I, what I, what I note often you see in publications, people talk about creating the alpha phase during irradiation, but it's never clear whether they've thought about it, thought it through, whether they're actually seeing alpha phase that was already there uh, before irradiation, or whether it's simply um, a thermal induced effect and it just took, it's an aging effect. Um, there are many, I find in my, recent experience in particular, there are many, many cases where people don't do the right control experiment to establish what is an irradiation effect compared to what is a thermal effect. Or or what is, um, when they see something in an irradiated material, how do they know it wasn't there to begin with, you know? Uh, again, this is just for a reference, is a table showing some of the main and secondary phases in stainless steels. The, um, the gamma prime here I talked about relates primarily to the A286 when you have a high nickel content, but primarily we're talking about mostly the gamma phase, which is the FCC. And that's, that's by far the, the largest compositional, the largest phase by, compos by volume fraction, a little bit of alpha. Um, the thing that distinguishes steels uh, or is important for steels often are the carbides that you form. Um, if you have a lot of nitrogen, some hardening from nitrogen or even weakening if you have um, stringers of nitrides, that's a problem. And forgive me, Mark, uh, <laughs> I, just, I did this just in case Aditya was online. Um, one of the most commonly observed hexagonal uh, or lamis phases in steels is the niobium uh, NBFE2, which is the C14 phase. Yes, so, I, I'm here too as well, uh, Malcolm. Who's that? Oh, this is uh, Laurent here. I'm I'm here too. Okay, this is for you. that was for your benefit then, Laurent. <laughs> <laughs> um, the 
TTT diagram uh, for stainless steel is shown here uh, for 316 stainless steel. Um, again, the primary focus of TTT diagrams in the industry, uh, mechanical engineers, is, is to know what kind of heat treatments you're going to get where carbides are going to be formed. Now, you may or you may not want carbides. Um, certainly in, in the high nickel alloys or in, or in um, high nickel super alloys, carbide precipitation on grain boundaries helps if there's a concern about grain boundary sliding. So um, there they, they deliberately want to have carbides. But in steels, typically carbides are can be harmful because the most common carbide that's formed is a chromium carbide. And if you form chromium carbide on grain boundaries, because carbi carbides typically form on grain boundaries, if you form chromium carbide on boundaries, you get depletion of chrome near the boundaries, and that's that invites intergranular attack. And I'll talk a bit about that as we go on. So uh, there is other phases, this uh, sigma phase, um, which I don't know much about, and the chi phase. Um, but they're in this reference here, if you want to read more about it. So just as we have, I mean, TTT diagrams are very useful. Here's the one for Inconel X750, much simpler. And primarily in X750, the main other component besides carbide formation is the gamma prime. And then here's Inconel 718. Just an aside for 718, I did I did some interesting uh, research recently looking at um, susceptibility to SCC. And it, it turns out that there was a lot of research done where people had, um, they're often in precipitation hardened materials, there are two stages. There's a high temperature heat treatment and then an intermediate heat treatment. Now, the intermediate heat treatment typically you invoke in order to create these gamma and gamma double prime in this case precipitates to harden the material. Um, but that, if it also induces uh, carbide formation, then then that may be detrimental. And what they, what uh, basically uh, was was observed, uh, what I observed anyway, is that if people quenched from a high temperature heat treatment and then did the aging, you got very different TTT characteristics, as you can probably well imagine, um, compared to something which was slow cooled. So because slow cooling, you end up somewhere in here and then you age a bit more and then you can, can certainly end up with some carbide precipitation or, or delta phase in this particular case, delta phase precipitation. Anyway, it's important that you understand um, when you're dealing with these alloys and there's a series of heat treatments prior to getting to the final structure, you have to be aware that of whether the one, one which stage is involved with quenching or not, um, and, and that's important. Uh, another issue, uh, and this is anecdote now, I was talking to a guy called Stu Malloy, uh, who works at Los Alamos, and he was um, showed, presented me a paper on Inconel 718, and these guys were looking at radiation effects in 718 and said, oh, look, we got all this gamma prime forming uh, from irradiation, and they presented it and said, this is a radiation effect. And I, and I said, I flipped back to him and said, do you know that you didn't have the gamma prime in there beforehand? And they said, no, no, it was, it was uh, annealed. And I said, well, you might want to check because when you install these things, you do heat treat them. And he checked and lo and behold, yes, <laughs> it was a welded window on his um, accelerator. It's probably an accelerator. And um, in the welding process, they'd heat treated it and that created gamma prime. So they had a paper there which was talking about radiation effects, which was basically not true. It wasn't a radiation effect. It was a thermal effect. Uh, important secondary phases in nickel alloys, certainly when it comes to um, embrittlement, are the delta and the eta phases. So in many nickel alloys, uh, 
there are reports, certainly high temperature irradiations where cracking occurs along eta phase platelets and also the delta phase in, in, uh, in canal 718. So X750 is the eta phase, which is this one. And in X750, it's the eta phase, which is this one. Basically, by and large, and I'm paraphrasing here, not desirable. They're not desirable phases um, because the material can be more brittle in that case. And then when it comes to, uh, I just add here that the gamma double prime, which I didn't have in the previous table, that relates to uh, Inconel 718. It's similar to gamma prime, which I should have mentioned is gamma prime is Ni3Al based uh, alloy. And gamma double prime is Ni3B based alloy. It, whereas the gamma prime is FCC, the gamma double prime is beast body center tetragonal. I guess that's the role of the niobium. And just to summarize those kind of observations, those what goes on in the TTT diagram, what, what happens when we, we form precipitates and where they form. Um, here's some of the main um, alloying elements that, that, that you will come across in steels and in nickel alloys. And this basically, um, kind of like a periodic table here, shows where the elements sit in the periodic table, and it identifies which of the phases which are uh, elements which segregate to grain boundaries, carbides, of course, Nio uh, borides also is there, and zirconium, that's a surprising one, I'm not quite sure about that one. Um, but these are the gamma prime and the gamma double prime phases, and I've shown here what the gamma prime is, what the structure is, it's an ordered FCC, um, and that basically induces some hardening, hardening both because of the ordering and the effect uh, on limiting dislocation slip through the ordered phase because you create an anti-phase boundary, but also because there's a slightly uh, different elastic properties of the material and some dilatation involved when these precipitates formed. So that all contributes to the hardening effect. So the uh, the other phase is the body center tetragonal. I don't I haven't put a diagram here because it gets too messy, but it's similar, um, but it's BCT. Uh, oh yeah, something you'll come across later. I'll point out later, um, and I haven't identified here uh, what are carbide formers. So hafnium's a carbide former, niobium's a carbide former, chromium's a carbide former, so it's molybdenum, um, and zirconium to some extent. So what you'll find in some stainless steels and some nickel alloys, they'll add niobium or molybdenum or, or tantalum. I think tantalum is also a carbide former um, in, in order to save the chromium. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned about depleting chromium at the grain boundaries because chromium is a strong carbide former, but that will deplete the chromium near the grain boundaries. And, and chromium is the active element for limiting corrosion. Um, and if you, if there's any risk of getting this kind of sensitization process happening, forming chromium carbides, best thing is to add some material like niobium or molybdenum, that will preferentially form with the carbides and, and basically save the, the chromium. So niobium and molybdenum are stronger carbide formants than chromium. And I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit more as we go through the, through the talk. So when it comes to FCC's um, austenitic steels or austenitic alloys, there are three main phases that we have to deal with. One is the body center cubic, the F and the face center cubic, and the hexagonal close packed. Um, and these are the crystal structures. So, and I want to be uh, basically uh, 
just to highlight the fact that these are the three main structures you might come across. FCC, which is the gamma phase, obviously is the one that is most common and is the one that is mostly uh, of interest. But when you have the alpha phase, it's a BCC um, structure. So there is a small amount of BCC one has to deal with. BCC is primarily in the pharidic region. Um, but if you also then get uh, martensite formation, trans transformation from the FCC to the HCP, the hexagonal close packed structure is also then important. So um, when it comes to deformation processes, what's important for all of these alloys is which plane is the most close packed. And, and when I say close packed, I, I mean which is the plane, which planes have the highest density of atoms on them. And in the BCC, it's the 110 plane. And the direction, the shortest direction is this one, is the direction from the corner of the cube to the center. For the FCC, the most, the densest plane is the 111 plane. And the shortest distance is this one going from the, the, the cube corner to midway along one face. And in the HCP, the most close back plane for ideal packing, I'm going to emphasize that because it doesn't apply to zirconium. For ideal packing, the most close back plane is, is this one. So, um, That only applies if you're making up uh, a crystal using ping pong balls. And I'm going to talk about ping pong balls in a minute. So the most close back plane is the basal one. If we're talking about ideal packing of spheres. But when it comes to real materials like zirconium, titanium, cadmium, zinc, um, beryllium, hafnium, um, the most close packed plane or the plane where you might actually expect slip to occur or dislocation loop formation varies depending on the C over A ratio. So for materials like zinc and cadmium, which have a high C over A ratio, that, that is the ratio of the dimension of the C axis compared to the A axis is large, then the basal plane is still the most dense, close packed. But when you um, shrink the material and you go below ideal, which is one point, a ratio of 1.633, um, uh, it's actually, um, yeah, one, when you go below that, which is close to what magnesium is, these other planes, the pyramidal and the prism planes become more important because the density of the atoms on those planes becomes larger than the density of the atoms on the basal plane. Now, um, so here you can see which, which are the most common slip planes in the different metals. For FCC metals, there's only one, and that's it. It's the uh, one on one plane, that's the one by one direction. For body centered cubic, the simplest one to, to think about is the 110 plane, but there are possibilities of slip on other planes, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the most common ones, which are these red ones, what I've highlighted in red here. Uh, in the case of the hexagonal or a close pack structure, um, the most slip systems, uh, sorry, the primary slip system is the 1-1 bar 2 on the basal. But when you get to things like zirconium and titanium, this shifts because you're stretching, you're, sorry, you're squishing along the C-axis and the close pack plane becomes non-basal. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about physical metallurgy here. So it's good to have an appreciation of what distinguishes an FCC structure from a, BC, a HCP structure. And that's all about stacking. 
And the body centered cubic structure has a, is a more open structure and it's, that's a separate issue. But I'm going to talk about the stacking of all three, the crystal structure, and um, explain a little bit some of the simpler aspects of what distinguishes these di three different crystal structures and what affects and what the crystal structure, what that does to the properties. So I'm going to start with a video, if I can. Okay, Mark, are you there? I, my uh, video had a lot of uh, stops, gaps. I guess it was it was too much to download. Did you have any problems seeing the video? On our end, it was uh, look good. The, okay, I, it must be my server. So I, so long as people are seeing it without interruption, because I get the interruptions, then I assume that the. Um, yeah, here uh, it was just, uh, very smooth, very, very clear, actually. OK, well, uh, thank you, Laurent. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Then. <laughs> I'll just I'll just carry on. So no matter what I see, it's my server's download speed is is not working that great. So I'll, I'll just carry on, assuming you guys can actually see everything smoothly. Perfect. OK, now I should be able to. OK. So um, that just explained about the stacking, um, and that's with the ball model. So that's the simplest way of creating a crystal structure, and but it really helps to understand some of the processes, such as dislocation slip, and how this varies from one material to another. So to talk about dislocation slip, I'm going to make use of an analogy here. Now, what are, what are we, what are we, but what I, first thing I wanted to point out is that 
I'm going to consider a, a crystal structure, which is, is really like this. Um, we're looking along rows of atoms here, and we're just looking down along rows of atoms. And imagine this is, this is the same as this, and this has a dislocation stuck in the middle. But imagine that we're looking along rows of atoms here. So we start with a perfect crystal. So one of the things um, about SLIP that I'm sure all of you know, and I'm going to just repeat it just to be boring, uh, is that we have these things called dislocations, and they, they make certain things possible. Now, if you had a single crystal, sorry, or a, a, any crystal, call it a single crystal, and let's pick a, a plane. And I, highlighted here in the, the filled circles and we're going to call that our slip plane that's what we want to um, where we're going to be deforming and if we go from this starting place position to this starting position one of the things we could do is just break all the bonds here and then transfer this top half of the crystal translate it to the right now that takes an awful lot of energy I mean, because basically it's, in effect, the theoretical strength of the material is what you need, is the, is, it would basically be the stress that you would need to uh, employ to basically break all the bonds at once at any, at any, on any one plane. So that's the shear strength in this case, but it could be also tensile strength if you were pulling this apart, if you're pulling in this direction but we're talking about a force now a shear force where we're pushing one half of the crystal in one direction and the other half of the crystal in the other direction so the analogy that many of you will probably be familiar with is the caterpillar analogy and how a caterpillar moves it doesn't move by <laughs> by jumping by stepping all at once it, it it moves by moving one segment at a time um the other analogy that's very popular is a carpet. If you have a carpet on a floor and you try and pull it, what you'll find is that it's, there's a lot of force, a lot of friction involved because all of the you're trying to you're trying to act against all of the the frictional forces that exist across the whole area of the carpet if you're pulling it in one direction. However, if you ruffle a piece up at one edge and then you work it across the carpet, you can actually move the carpet just simply by moving one row at a time, if you like, or one line of the carpet at a time and pushing that from one side to the next. So in, in this particular analogy, it's, it's the caterpillar. And what we see in terms of what, what this means in terms of the crystal structure is that we start here and we're pushing one layer of atoms. Remember, this, this demarcates, this defines, these black dots define what I'm calling the slip plane. It doesn't, there's not, nothing different about those atoms. It just helps you focus on what, what the slip plane is. And when we first start the process, you what do you do is you take this, these, this row of three atoms and you push them into the lat lattice. And if you'll notice here, the the plane here at the side is, is, is bent outwards, and that's because of the elastic stress field coming from this extra half plane of atoms, which you forced into the crystal. And if you notice at the other side, it's still fairly straight because the, the, strain, the stress strain field from this dislocation basically diminishes as, about as one over R, because you want to go away from the, um, from the, from the, uh, from the dislocation itself. But as this dislocation, as you could proceed and you push further, and as this dislocation moves further across the crystal, eventually it'll start to distort the other side of the crystal. And eventually this, this distortion on this side of the crystal, on the left side of the crystal, will diminish as the, as the dislocation gets further and further away. And eventually the, the crystal is back in, um, coincidence and here in this part there's there's no we don't see any um we, we're back to perfect crystal again so just to illustrate these points um we're going through the stepwise process 
So what I'm, the point I want to make, because sometimes it can be confusing. Um, I had one guy who, at, at Chalk River once who said, oh, yeah, but when a dislocation passes through the crystal, doesn't it weaken it? And I said, no, <laughs> because the, the, the bonds reform. And so when a, when a, unless you're an antiphase boundary or something other like that, something weird that you change the stacking sequence, on the on the plane where the crystal is, is, is moved, um, if you've if you've translated by a perfect lattice distance, the crystal that you're left with once the dislocation has passed through, the crystal has no memory of of the passage of the dislocation. So we'll talk about slip now again. If I can, I got to. Go into my mouse mode here. So I'm getting a lot of interference here. Hey, Laurent, because mine gets interrupted all the time, can you tell me when your video is over and I can continue? Okay. Um, yes, actually, when you talked, you talked a bit over your own video, but yeah, I think it's uh, pretty clear here. The I mean, maybe I can ask when, I mean, do the students, uh, can. Oh, it's uh, running again now. Oh, that's and, uh, my fault. Maybe a student just uh, let us know if it's, if the partial concept is clear. Yeah. So for now, I mean, we can, we can go through the, any questions after the fact, uh, Laura, what I, what I'm really wanting for now is because, because my, uh, download speed is slow. Um, my video gets interrupted, and gotcha. so I can. Be well, it, it worked. Uh, it worked fine. I think. Uh, yeah, this was. Uh, we we got to see it. Okay, so all I'm all I'm looking for is, I don't know when the video when you've seen the end of the video because mine's still a third of the way through, for example. So okay, in order great. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, yeah, we we've seen it. Okay, that's great. So we'll continue on. So every time I have a little video, Lauren, if you could just maybe put a thumbs up or something and just say ended now or something will do I'll, I'll just just say it and i'll follow now here's a uh, another video on slip versus twinning
OK, we're good. OK, um, just want to say, Laurent, I'm going to be talking about the, the partials after this. So I'm, I'm just demonstrating something with the bowl models to begin with, and then we'll we'll talk about the um, what this actually means in terms of the, the vectors and stuff like that after that. So here's another one. Oh. Oh well, no, that's what I want the one I just done. So we'll talk about dislocation slip in hexagonals now. OK, we're good. OK. So I noticed some people, Veshek and Mahdi, um, are, are not seeing the video. Um, so so I, maybe what we can do, I mean, it's being recorded, so they'll be able to take a look at it uh, later on. And worst case, I mean, 
yeah, maybe the students who did see it can uh, uh, show oh. them how to work yeah. the ping pong balls. Actually, Vishek now tells me he could see it. Anyway, okay, so we'll yes. I, 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 have... I guess we need to just click on the, uh, you know, video. Each each person can control it uh, uh, on his own, actually. Okay. Okay, so I think there's 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 one more, and um, and we'll just plot on. Okay, you're good. Okay. Thanks, Laura. So I've got to remember where we were. Um, I think I just finished with talking about non basal slip in hexagonals, and this just gives you an idea of the the um, displacements that the atom, the layers have to go through when moving uh, in, in, in certain, um, on certain slip systems. So this is the 1, 1 bar to all on O1. It's a very small um, dilatational displacement in order to make that transition for two partials, which is the, um, shown here is one third one bar 1, 0, 1 0 type. And uh, whereas if we, if we talk about um, C plus A slip, which is this one, and I just demonstrated there for the one above one plane, we have a much more substantial, much larger uh, dilatational displacement that has to be overcome in order to make that slip happening happen. So again, one one bar two on Parisian plane is also a small, and there's, there's almost an intermediary low energy state, but it really isn't. So it, it's, it's really only one step in effect. And the interesting one is one one bar two on pyramidal, it's just, in just one step, there's no partial in, in, involved. And I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit more about partials in the coming slides. So just to summarize, we have, uh, when it comes to hexagonals, we have slip and twinning. Um, these are the typical slip planes, but also we have this possibility of twinning on non-basal planes. So twinning, let me emphasize, I don't know, I can't remember now whether I said it in the video. Twinning occurs when you have the possibility of a partial shear on each successive plane. 
So if you can't shear in the same direction on each successive plane, you can't twin. Uh, so what does this mean? Um, I mentioned about screw dislocations and edge dislocations in one of the videos. What's the difference between a screw and an edge dislocation? Here we're talking, we've got, if you remember back to the analogy with the uh, caterpillar, you'll remember what, what happens when we create a displacement going from a cube here to get to this final shape. And we can, but the thing is we can do that two ways. So we, we end up with the same final shape here. I'll use my pointer. We've got the same final shape and we're essentially starting with the same cube, but in, in an edge dislocation, we start along one edge and we push this extra half plane into the into the interior uh, and shove it uh, using the caterpillar or the carpet analogy all the way across the crystal. In a screw, we start along the other edge perpendicular and shear the top half of the crystal relative to the bottom half of the crystal. Uh, the analogy, I think, would be like tearing a telephone book. For those of you who have torn a telephone book in two, um, you'll know what I mean. You can start at one edge or shear the telephone book and start at, uh, on a few pages and, and eventually work your way through the whole through the whole telephone book. But anyway, it's the dislocation line moves across the crystal in this direction, but the displacement that you get in the end from that shear um, is the same as an edge dislocation. So I talked in the videos, I showed you about the difference between, with the ball models, the difference between slip and twinning, and that's worth emphasizing here with, with some um, schematics here. Here's a tensile specimen that we pull. Uh, here's all the atoms all lined up. And then we, we if we pull, and we get slip on certain slip planes, the material shears over to, to one side. And because we've, we've moved one lattice spacing in each case, the crystal then is still basically intact, it's still a perfect crystal in the, uh, after the dislocation has passed through. But a twin is a different operation because you shear by a partial on each successive plane. And a partial naturally is not a full lattice displacement. If it was, if it was a full lattice displacement, then we'd see no um, change in orientation. Um, but because we're shearing by a partial, which is not a full lattice displacement on each successive plane, it, we end up with a change in the orientation of the lattice. Oh, uh, again, this this might come up because of um, this is a tensile. This is an illustration of a tensile specimen. If this is a tensile specimen and we have a load line here, naturally, when the material slides over here, you're going to induce some constraints. So uh, if, if if my load line, if I can draw it, if my load line is is here. Whoops, that's not very good. And the connection to the top of the crystal is here, then we're going to induce a torque in the, in the crystal if we if we have a tensile specimen. And that just to illustrate that shows here is a here's a tensile specimen that you're shearing. We displace the connection with the load frame, but the load line stays here, and therefore. And therefore, whoops, I can't draw this very well. And therefore, yeah, I get wonky at the end. <laughs> and therefore, we have to bend the specimen in order, and it's elastic bending. We have to elastically bend it in order to conform with the constraints imposed by the load frame. So let me just. Um, Yeah. So anyway, that's just uh, that's just to emphasize because you might he hear people talking about distortions caused during testing. And this is just the reason why we have these kind of elastic distortions. But of course, once you unhook the specimen, it'll flip back to this shape.
So, um, what is a twin and what is a uh, what is slip? I again I've demonstrated that with the ball models, but here again it's just to do it schematically. In a case of slip, we're shearing one half of the crystal and translating it with respect to another half of the crystal. With a twinning, we we are actually in, instead of slip all on one plane, we have slip on each successive plane by a partial, by a little bit. And in, in the case of FCC, by the time you've got to the third layer, you've translated one full lattice displacement. So if you had a, a point here, it would be one lattice displacement over to here. But anyway, the, the, they're very similar distortions ultimately, but the shape change is obviously different and the orientation is different. And this is how twins would be represented in FCC crystal. The 111 plane here is, this, is the twinning plane. It's the same as the slip plane. And then there's a twinning direction. And this is the 11 bar 2 twinning direction. It goes from here to here. And there's an invariant plane, which is the 110 plane, which is this one. Um, How does this, how can I explain this a little bit better? Well, I can with this kind of ball model here. In the case of, um, if we look at the atoms actually as they appear in the cube, uh, and imagine there's the cube corners here and there's uh, an atom at the face. I've taken out the atom that would be here, sorry. There would be an atom here at the center of this cube face but I've taken it out so it's easier to see what's going on on this slip plane here, which is shaded here. And basically what happens is in order to move one lattice spacing, which takes this atom here and moves it to here, I have two partials, there's two partial movements. And these partials occur um, on one plane above another plane, if you like. Um, in this case, uh, if we're imagining uh, the a B layer moving with respect to the the lower layer, the A layer, the the motion would be that and that, and these are these are the two partials, which are these Burgess vectors, and that takes my red atom here to another red atom site, and the crystal is um, then in a perfect state. In a twin, we we move every successive layer by this this first this first shear this one this shockley shear the the red to the green and but we we do each one the same and what happens is that my one layer let's start with the green layer it moves into a b site a blue site the blue layer moves into a red site and the red site then moves on to the um, the green site so by the time we've done three displacements which is this over three planes in the bulk, we end up with this displacement of um, essentially in, 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 in the lateral direction here, but at a height, which is three atoms layer above the base, base plane. I think that, I hope that's clear. The best way to uh, understand that is to actually build yourself a little ball model and, and do it. Um, that's one of the things, uh, perhaps, Laurent, Mark, you guys, if you don't have it, um, you should have something available in, in the lecture room, some ball models, just so that one can play around with this kind of thing. It makes it much more understandable. I got a thumbs up. Thank you, Laurent. <laughs> um, so the other thing I wanted to mention is and I want to address it when it, because it's relevant in terms of steel, is, is what is Martin site? I mean, you all know, because you all did um, basically material science, metallurgy, that a Martin site is a displacive transformation. So either the crystal or, well, in, in, in the case of a Martin site, you're actually changing the crystal structure. But it's very similar to twinning in that it, it occurs 
often by a shear displacement. So when it comes to forming epsilon martensite, which is the hexagonal phase from the FCC phase, as I mentioned earlier, it really involves, if you only talk about three layers, let's discuss three layers, it only involves the displacement of one of those three layers, and you can then transform from FCC into HCP. And so this is what I think I'm going to talk about next. You know what I'm going to say? Sorry, I'm going to leave this on. Because I think I think I put this in because it involves Martin said this. Okay, it's done. Thanks, Laura. I, I was going to say, I, I think I was going to say, um, I, I don't know whether I got to the mountain site cheer on that. Did I? No, you uh, showed the twin, uh, how you can do accumulate yeah. partials to get a, a twin. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I think I must have thought that that was the one where I showed the mountain site. Um, if I can navigate forward. No, I don't think I did. Um, unfortunately, and I'll just state it here. Martin site is like a twin operation, except you shear every other plane. So instead of shearing every, every plane the same as you would with a twin, for a Martin site, you shear alternate planes, and I thought I had it in one of these, but not sure. Okay, so the other crystal structure is BCC. This is the most close back plane in the BCC. It's the 110 plane, or 1 bar 10 plane in this particular case. And the shear, um, if, you, if, you, if we're looking at um, movement of one, plane of atoms relative to another and going from here to here, which is one lattice displacement, it involves three partials. And these are the three partials shown here. So it's kind of neat because this also relates, helps understand a little bit about the Martin Siddick transformation when you're talking about um, the body center cubic Martin site. Um, what one can observe if one takes the BCC layer, it's very easy to create um, a, uh, a BCC-like structure, something pseudo BCC from the hexagonal structure and vice versa, of course. So these are all reversible transformations depending on the, on the stress state, of course. So, these balls on the bottom show the, the one one by one o plane. Um, that's not one by one. That's in fact that's bar one o bar one one o plane um, on the on the basically the close back plane in the in the BCC. Um, and when you um, if you shear one of the layers with respect to the other, but only by a partial amount, if we only go this amount, this is the equivalent of, um, and we do it on every successive layer, this is the equivalent of taking one layer and moving the atoms a little bit here, from here to here. So, um, if we look at the red lines here, this, this represents one layer. 
and, and the one atom there in the center. But if we look at the second layer below, these atoms would reside on these points. But when we shear one layer with respect to the next, these atoms move with respect to this top layer a little bit. And that becomes then closer to a hexagonal crystal structure. And that's why when people in steels, in the steel industry, when they talk about um, epsilon martensite being a precursor to forming the body center cubic martensite, it's because in going from body center cubic to hexagonal, there's a fairly easy martensitic transformation. If we shear every second layer a little bit, then we come to something which is close to a hexagonal structure. And then once you're at the hexagonal structure, which is epsilon martensite in, in relative to FCC, it is then easy then to then make the next transition to um, FCC. So there's a link between FCC, HCP, BCC. So I'll hopefully explain this now with another video. Okay. Okay, thanks, Laura. Uh, is an I think I've done this one. Next one.
Okay, uh, it worked. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'll move on there. Okay, <coughs> the other type of mountain site that you may be familiar with is, is the quench mountain site. This is the one that often gets confused. Um, it frustrates me sometimes when I read publications and people talk about mountain site and they don't say what mountain site. Now, the the one that steel people know is the one that you get from quenching, and it's a body centered tetragonal. So if you quench from the uh, from the from the out from the actually from the austenite phase, if you the high temperature phase in in uh, low alloy steels or carbon steels um, is is still austenite is FCC, and when you quench. You end up with this. Um, you end up with a situation where the the material wants to transform into a BCC, and there is still carbon in solution, and the carbon has nowhere to go. If it if it if it can't diffuse away and form precipitates, cementite and stuff like that, it gets trapped in the lattice, and then it forms this body centered tetragonal tetragonal structure, which is resistant to deformation and is therefore a hardening phase. And if you temper it, if you heat treat it, uh, you can allow the carbon to diffuse and then you get to the BCC phase. So this is the, the what is commonly considered the martensite um, form that you get in low alloy steels. In this particular case, it's from quenching. It's not from, uh, it's not from, it's a diffusion-less transformation, which Really, what defines mountain site, but it's it's not from a um, it's not a displacive transformation. Whereas other mountain site transformations, when you get what we what we would call BCC mountain site formed from the gamma phase, which is the FCC phase, that is a displacive transformation, as is the hexagonal close packed mountain site. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, to get to the BCC Martin site um, from the FCC phase, the, the transformation can follow the route FCC, HCP to BCC. So there's a there's a pathway. And often people who in a radiated sample see signs of what we call the epsilon phase. Um, this is often taken as a precursor to the formation of the BCC phase. I think it doesn't really matter. You know, it's it's still a an inhomogeneous phase and it's still going to harden the material. OK, this is what I should have had earlier. <laughs> this is talking about the Martin site. So I, I'm, I apologize to everybody. I had this video in the wrong place. This is what we should have seen earlier. And this explains martensite transformation from hexagonal to FCC. Apologies. OK, it worked. OK. Thank you. Um, again, I apologize. I should have had this earlier, um, but I hope 
people didn't get too confused by the fact of referring to the Epsilon Martin site without having fully demonstrated it. Okay, um, here's just an illustration from a book by a guy called Muir, where he talks about all these different transformations and how we get from the gamma phase, which is FCC. Uh, he talks about creating faults, where, which would just be like if you take a plane and you uh, and you shear one plane, uh, you can create a stacking fault. That's one partial. But if you shear every plane by the same partial, you end up with a twin. Orientation has changed. If you um, alternate the shear on each each plane, you end up with epsilon Martin site. And then it's an easy, because this is hexagonal now, it's an easy transformation then to move from this hexagonal phase to the BCC phase by the method I described earlier. So what does this mean engineering wise? Well, Epsilon Martin site in particular, you can create Epsilon Martin site very easily. Um, I guess in a constrained material, in one sense it might twin, might shear by twinning um, per, if it's unconstrained. But if there's a limitation in the amount of shear you can have, you may be limited by to, to having a, a smaller amount of strain. Um, twinning shear in FCC is basically about 70% shear strain. But if you if you're if you have some restrictions and, and you can only do 35% shear strain, you might end up with a lot of epsilon martin site instead. So typically when you're deforming a material, you get twins and epsilon martin site and dislocations. You get a whole bunch of, of, of complicated structures, but they're all essentially sheared uh, in the in the case of dislocations, that's a planar shear. And in the case of both epsilon a Martin site formation and in the twins, that's a um, that's a bulk shear. It happens over a number of different planes. Okay, I now I've kind of gone through a little bit of the physical metallurgy that might be important. We we'll get into more interesting stuff, uh, which is radiation damage. So many of you probably are familiar with radiation effects. You've probably had this in some of your lectures, and I'm just going to quickly um, recap what we're talking about. So typically, high energy neutrons in a nuclear reactor uh, produce collision cascades. In the case of a 1 MeV neutron, you can have hundreds of displaced atoms per for collision. So what happens is a high energy neutron comes in, transfers energy to what's called a primary knock-on. That goes on then to create further displacements within the lattice. But when we're dealing with materials, especially those containing nickel alloys, um, thermal neutrons are also important. Um, actually, both for iron and chrome um, alloys. The thermal neutron capture cross-section is, is quite high relative to zirconium. So unless you're talking about zirconium, uh, if you're talking about other structural alloys, such as steels, you have to take into account the thermal neutrons because it can be a substantial contribution to the total amount of damage, especially in a reactor like a candy reactor when you have a high thermal neutron uh, flux. And basically what happens with the thermal neutron, it comes in, but it's so slow it gets absorbed. And typically it'll emit a prompt gamma ray. And that um, induces a recoil in the emitting atom uh, because this is a certain mass involved or a certain energy, which has a relativistic mass. And the recoiling atom then goes on to displace further atoms. And those cascades are often much smaller uh, probably five atoms in, in a typical cascade, but still can be substantial if the thermal neutron flux is high. What happens when you have nickel is that that first reaction gives you some displacements, 
but it also creates uh, an, an isotopic change. It transmutes the nickel 58, which is the common isotope in nickel, to nickel 59. And when you have nickel 59, that is a very high, also a very, well, it has a much higher thermal neutron capture cross-section compared to nickel 58. And then once you have nickel 59 produced, it can, it can, uh, it produces, uh, reacts with thermal neutrons to produce protons and gamma rays. And because the mass of these particles is so much larger, the recoiling collision cascade is very much larger. So, so when you have nickel 59, it can be, have a substantial effect on the enhancing the damage, the displacement damage. Now, of course, you have to first create the nickel 59, and typically it takes five to 10 years in a can-do reactor to obtain the optimum concentration of nickel 59, where you're, you're balancing the production from nickel 58 with the burning out of the nickel 59 because of these other reactions, which also transmute the nickel 59 and, and make other elements like cobalt. Um, and so you end up with, um, after about five years, 10 years, you end up with about three or four percent of nickel 59, depending on what the, where, you, where you are in the, in the reactor. And this can then, um, that, that's a substantial amount. But more importantly, compared to the amount of displacement damage, it's the production of the protons, which is hydrogen, and the alpha particles, which is helium. So that's an important aspect of the nickel 59 production. So normally helium and, and hydrogen on for most common isotopes are only produced in high energy reactions. Right? That's for neutrons with energies greater than 5 MeV. But where nickel 59 becomes important is that you can produce these, these reactions forming the alpha and the, the NP reactions um, with very low energy neutrons. So when you have a high thermal neutron flux, you wouldn't normally have the option to create uh, helium, but if you create nickel 59 first, you produce substantial amounts of helium. So in the Candu reactor, some of you may know in the Candu reactor, there's about 30,000 APPM after at the end of life, um, 30,000 atomic parts per million of helium at the end of life. So again, just to talk about what this means in terms of cross sections, here's, um, I've got a PWR here, I guess, I don't have a can do, oh, I do have a can do one, but I didn't put it in for whatever reason. Um, so here's a PWR spectrum shown here, and this is the flux for unit lethargy. Don't worry about the unit lethargy. We can talk about that some other time. Um, and this is the core average value, and then this is the um, value of the spectrum the, at the periphery, just, just inside, just in board of the pressure vessel. And these values here are the displacement cross sections. So um, you can consider those events that I was talking about and effectively derive a fractional concentration of how many atoms you get for um, for each thermal neutron uh, at a given energy. And uh, basically what it, what it means is that at a given neutron energy, let's say um, 0.1 EV, there's a certain probability that you're going to create an, uh, at that that atom or that you can displace an atom. It's not just the primary knock on atom, but it's also the multiplied by the number of atoms in the cascade on average. So this is kind of like a kind of like a probability of causing an atomic displacement, but it's it's scaled with respect to how many displacements you get for each primary event. And that's this green line is what you get for zirconium. And these other lines here are what you get for iron, chrome, and nickel. Um, and basically, this just illustrates how the low thermal neutron capture cross-section of, of, of zirconium, how it has an impact, certainly, on the damage production. Uh, 
So when we look at the cross sections as a function of neutron energy, um, and, and when if we're looking at the display, these have to be calculated, but these, these displacement cross sections, they go up as you go to lower and lower energies. Uh, and this just reflects the um, likely probability of a gamma ray being absorbed. And it, it increases as you decrease your energy. So we, in these any gamma reactions occur and cause displacements down this energy range. And the, any, the elastic reactions, the direct displacements caused by um, collision, uh, momentum transfer and collisions occurs in this energy range. So down here for these neutrons, for these low energy neutrons, we have four or five displacements per event. And in this, this case, we have a, hundreds of neutron of displacements per event. Uh, I mentioned about the N alpha cross sections. So here's the N alpha cross sections. These are the helium producing cross sections. And you'll see here, the blue line here represents the nickel 58, which is the probability essentially of creating an alpha particle or N alpha reaction at a certain neutron energy. So in this case, it's um, a 10 MeV. We have a high energy, high neutron energy. Um, there's a reasonably high probability to create helium with even with naturally occurring nickel. But most of our spectrum, especially for a candy reactor, we don't have many neutrons at that high energy. So typically this doesn't become that important. However, if, if um, in the case of the nickel 58, which absorbs thermal neutrons very easily, and we create nickel 59, this is the displacement cross section, sorry, the N alpha cross section for nickel 59. And this reaction is the one that causes most of the atomic displacements, but it also produces helium. And this red line here has been scaled by the by the production efficiency, if you like, from the from the uh, nickel 58. It's about three it's scaled by about three or four percent. So if we had pure nickel 58, this 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 would be um, two orders of magnitude larger, basically. And this is the iron and the chrome. Um, it's just to show that even with naturally occurring nickel, you can have a substantial amount of helium produced if you have high energy neutrons. OK, that was a very short review of radiation damage. Some of you will know that. Some of you might be new. Um, but what are we talking about? What, what we're interested in is what happens during radiation. So I got some more videos here. I took these off the internet. These are not mine, not me, but uh, they're um, videos put together by a guy called Ian Robertson, who you may know. And this is unirradiated material, and this is an in-situ um, experiment where the material is deformed and they're observing the slip of dislocations no burgers vector, don't know what the dislocations are, but I assume that they're um, one one dislocations on a one 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 plane. Uh, whether they're screw or edge, it's hard to say, or probably mixed character. And this is what happens after you have irradiated. So what they did is they took this sample, they went and irradiated it, and then put it back in the microscope and, they, and then repeated the experiment. And then you can see how very much slower it is. And this just illustrates the hardening effect of, of uh, what it, in effect are submicroscopic clusters because you can't you can't really make anything out. You can see some little black dots, but um, basically very small point defect clusters. If you up the temperature a little bit and we look at something like you might be familiar with zircaloy and you look at unirradiated material and you irradiate it at a reasonable temperature, we have this familiar structure that you get, which is uh, dislocation loop formation. What do we mean by dislocation loops? Well, we, we've got all those displaced atoms. We take all these displaced atoms 
here, the black dots, and look at all of the holes that left behind, they can actually cluster together. They'll they'll do so elastically, and and then form little platelets on certain closed packed planes. And this is what a dislocation loop is. This is an interstitial loop. This is extra mass stuffed between the planes. And in this case, we've taken the mass out. So there's a collapse of the planes. Um, as a function of neutron dose, in this case, it's displacements per atom. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with displacements per atom, you probably all are. Uh, if you think about it, um, if you have a a cubic meter of material and you have 10 to the 29 atoms or something like that in the material and you displace 10 to the 28 of those atoms in a certain time um, this, this would be 1.1 dpa it's very unwieldy to talk about well we've got a concentration of displaced point defects of 10 to the 28 um, in per cubic meter the easiest thing is to say, well, that's 10 to the 28 displaced atoms out of a total of 10 to the 29. So that is a concentration of 0.1 displacements for every atom in the, in the material. And that's why we use, that's one of the reasons why I use this DPA measure. And this just shows that the, uh, with increasing dose, the, the microstructure changes and we increase the, the, the damaged up to some saturated level. Uh, in steels, it occurs at around about 1 to 2 dpa. In zirconium alloys, it's much smaller. It's about 0.3 dpa. We, we'd saturate about this point. Uh, not only does it saturate if you pick a certain uh, dose between 3 and 20 dpa here, after the saturation, there's a temperature dependence. And we see there's a peak uh, amount of damage you get at around about 300 degrees C. And this just tells me that um, the combined effects of recombination and clustering uh, gives you an optimal condition where we can form uh, radiation damage. If you're at a low enough temperature, you don't get any damage. This was a so image is taken at Queens, by the way, <laughs> and it just shows that if you're at high temperature, this is in Austin, uh, in Canal X750, some space material. If you're at high temperature, you get evidence of radiation damage, but if you're at low temperature, you don't. And that's because in this particular case at the low temperatures, you get recovery of the dislocation structure. It heals itself. Uh, what does this mean in terms of mechanical properties? If we look at um, different doses for different materials, we got veridic steel here, 316 standard steel zircaloy here, and we look at the effect of radiation, the radiation tends to increase the hardness and reduce the ductility. Um, when it comes to nickel alloys, there's a difference between um, what we call precipitation hardened materials and um, solution annealed materials. Solution annealed materials, we get this hardening effect of radiation and a reduction in ductility. But for precipitation hardened materials, the effect of the radiation isn't as significant. And that's primarily because most of the hardening comes from the precipitation to begin with. And it, the effect of a radiation doesn't add to the strength of the material very much. So there's another thing that happens with with um, two things that one can consider happening in in canal or in canal is in nickel alloys. Um, one is the yield strength in alloys containing the gamma prime precipitates. They actually dissolve with the radiation. So at the, this is the function of dose. In, initially, when you irradiate something, you'll create all these loops and it saturates at around about one or two dpa. Um, and then it's over. The, you, 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 you're done. You're from the from the loops there. They've, they've contributed whatever they're going to do to the strength. But over a longer period, up to 20 dpa, in this particular case, you see this decrease in the yield strength. And that's attributed to the dissolution of the gamma prime precipitates. 
There's another thing that happens um, in Inconel 718. You can start out with a fairly ductile material and then you irradiate and you get some strengthening effect that, that we talked about from the loops. Um, and it's separate now from the yield strength. This is the this is the embrittlement. This is the, the failure stress or stress strain curve. And what happens in Inconel 718, we get to almost um, complete zero ductility condition at a fairly high dose. And this is actually linked to uh, the fact that you've also got helium being produced in this particular case. So generally, um, for FCC materials, they in undergo hardening, some reduction in ductility, um, but they, they still remain quite tough during irradiation or after irradiation. Whereas for BCCs, we get a drastic reduction in ductility, even though there's an increase in the, in the strength. And that's one of the reasons why FCC, BCC materials are not used within reactor cores because they, they're subject to embrittlement. So typically they're used outside of the core uh, in pressure retaining components where the effect of radiation is very weak, but even then in pressure vessels, you can still have a, an issue, a problem after many years of operation of embrittlement. So this particular picture of embrittlement does not apply to helium. So let's move on. Uh, what is what is the process of this embrittlement and this low drop here? Well, strain localization. If you look at an irradiated stainless steel, in this case 316 stainless steel, and look at it after it's been tested with a TEM, and you'll see these channels. Um, localized channels and what happens is that the dislocations sweep through them, through the material and clear out the damage creating softer regions. So on a stress strain curve, what it would look like is that we, we, we have this strain, stress, and then we get a low drop. And that low drop corresponds with a, with a uh, localized shear in a certain layer, which clears out the damage and actually softens the material at the same time. And you might get a second low drop, and that would be the initiation of a secondary slip system like this. And eventually the, the thing would just fail. So what are we talking about? Well, in that, sorry, in this particular case, this is also illustrated schematically here, showing what happens when um, you deform a material. If it slips on one plane, you get this distortion of the uh, of the sample, the elastic distortion, because you have to maintain the load line. But this can be alleviated to some extent by operating a secondary slip system, in which case, if you have the two aligned like this, you'll end up with the load line staying on the center of the specimen. Oh, this didn't show up too well. Uh, don't know why that did not show up too well. There's a little schematic here, a little video showing. I don't know whether it's just me not seeing this or not, but um, it just illustrates how dislocations flowing through the material sweep up these little loops. They they collect them, if you like, and they can be incorporated in the dislocation, and the dislocation can continue moving. So it's it's you may or may not have difficulty envisaging what's going on, but basically the the dislocation, the gliding dislocation and the loops have a similar Burgess vector, so they can react together and create a, um, the loops can add to the dislocation, make it climb, and it can continue gliding through the material. But in doing so, it sweeps up more and more loops, and eventually you get these layers, these um, of loop free material or relatively loop free material uh, within within the within within the irradiated structure and that's and that is then easier than to continue the deformation this becomes a softer path for further deformation and the deformation gets concentrated within this layer and that's what's called strain localization 
And you'll notice the strain, the, the dislocations here and the kind of ragged nature of these, these channels. I'm going to just quickly point out that um, people refer to this uh, and this and they, they often I see this in publications and look at this and they'll assume everything is channeling. But here's an example here in uh, A286 where this guy uh, Fournier did a test, did some fatigue tests and he noticed these is channeling through what's called gamma, what's the gamma prime here. Um, and he assumed that that was channeling. But really, I think what's likely happening here is that that's a twin. And what the twin would do would be rotate the crystal so that the same diffraction conditions that apply here in the matrix do not apply here. So essentially what he's doing is he's tilting the crystal so he can't see the gamma prime in this, along this layer. Here's another example by a guy called Onchi, a Japanese guy, and he does the same thing. He says, well, we see these channels and we're going to, this is the, the channeling, the classic channeling, that type of thing. But the images are just too straight, too clean. And he even says, he sees evidence of twin, of twin character at the edges of these channels. That just tells me it's a twin. <laughs> so, um, I'm just amazed at how many people uh, in the publications have, have got away with this, reporting stuff as if it, if it was slip, but really it's it's twinning, and uh, that's by far the, in my opinion, I'd be willing to hazard a, a bet on many of these things. It's just too clean often. It's just too clean to be um, the kind of strain localization we normally talked about. So here's the same thing with Onchi. And you can see these these channels, and he's still calling them dislocation slip, and it just doesn't make sense. So that brings me on to something closer to home. Um, this is to do with ink canal spaces. Here's a, an example of a crack that's formed in a microtensile test at Chalk River Labs. And you'll notice here we have this um, uh, this feature here uh, that seems to be aligned with the crack. So. Um, I put this together to illustrate the effect of, of diffraction conditions, what, what, how important they are. Now, in this particular case, the, the worker was interested in the cavity. So you get specifically, um, I don't know why this is going ahead of me. Uh, this is going crazy. I'm not pressing anything here. Oh, man. The interest was in the cavities. And for that, you specifically want um, absorption contrast, no diffraction contrast, and you, you basically want some Fresnel diffraction conditions. And therefore, the contrast of other stuff isn't very apparent. So um, in this particular case, when this was reported, the guy called this a slip band. And I guess nobody had any reason to doubt it, but to me it looked odd because it looks like it's a different orientation so just like those guys on chi and fournier when they talked about <coughs> channels from dislocation slip I'm, i wonder whether they're actually talking about twins i'm not saying that this is a twin just didn't know what it was so i remember asking him about it and he just said it was a slip band and i said well it looks like a different orientation and he said that that's that's what a slip band does, and, that, and that's nonsense, basically. So here's a slip band. So this is what we actually do when we see a slip band in a TEM. We're actually taking a slice. We're making a thin foil, and we're taking a slice through a slip plane. God damn it, why is this, why is this not working? We're taking a slice through a slip plane, and we see the dislocations that were on the slip plane, but a, but a section of the dislocation. So we, we cut them off at the top and the bottom of the foil. And we're looking down from above. So that's quite separate. So in, in terms of um, causing a tilt of the crystal, as you can see here, there's no difference in the contrast. 
either side of the slip band. There's no evidence here that there's actually a, a contrast change. You see the contrast from the dislocation, which is the distortion of the planes around the dislocation, but no gross tilt of the crystal. You can get a gross tilt of the crystal if you align all of your dislocations in what's called a subgrain boundary. Um, to, just to talk a little bit about geometrically necessary dislocations, this is what is meant when I first talked about geometrically necessary dislocations. How do we get bending from dislocations? And he's really he was really talking about subgrain boundaries. But in the context of a slip band or an, an array of dislocations all on one plane, I guess you could think of it in terms of this kind of type of configuration. By the way, Nye was one of my lecturers when I was at Bristol. Um, but there's a, there's a problem here. The orientation of the crystal above and below the slip band does not change. Um, slip is a translation. It doesn't tilt the sample. Um, and if you, and that's quite separate, not to be confused with the distortion around the dislocation. So planes bend around the dislocation core, but if you're away from the dislocation core, the orientation of the crystal is the same above and below. So there's this region here around the dislocation core, which gives you this contrast here. Um, and this, therefore, this configuration here, which would cause bending of the, the foil, is not to be confused with what happens when you slip something. Because what you're doing is you're pushing all these half planes and you're forcing them along one half of the crystal and pushing them on the other on the other side. This particular case here, what we see here, you, what we're missing here is the other half, <laughs> the other half of the crystal. What we've done here is actually stuffed extra material in between the planes. And that's not slip you could potentially have uh, an array of prismatic loops on one surface of a crystal, and that would distort the, distort the material, but it's not caused by slip. That is, that is a, a climb or a, a loop alignment issue. So to get back to that um, slip thing, uh, fortunately, more recently, there was some follow-up uh, investigation. When I asked this guy about the sample, I said, can, can you not check to see what this, this structure is? And he said, no, I've destroyed the sample. It turns out he hadn't destroyed the sample, he just didn't want to look. And, and a more recent publication by Jason Wang um, looked at exactly the same area. So this feature here that he was calling a slip band is the same feature. You can see it relative to this little funny shaped crack up here. It's the same feature that Jason was looking at. And when Jason looked at it, there's that feature that was called a slip band. And this is what Jason sees. And as you can see, um, this is a, a cluster in effect either twin or martensite platelets, the ones I was just describing. And this is some odd <laughs> uh, blurry contrast because the intent was to show the cavities. So not to be too critical about the, the diffraction conditions, but some further work could have been done here to establish really what was in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this band, what was responsible for this fuzzy contrast here. And it's really this clustering of other other um, other material, which is either a twin and or epsilon martensite. So, uh, oh yeah, this is just another example where people talked about slip bands, but really, no, that's a twin. So when people say these things, can you trust them? Um, when they're not backed by proof, and if they're not showing the evidence, in, in this case, that additional work was not provided at this time. So once Jason 
showed this image. Oh, OK, that makes sense. And that's why it's cracking along this edge. Because cracking occurs along a mountain site and at an Ada phase platelets. Another feature about uh, of that same work was further along along that feature. You can see it here now in a better image. You'll notice it's curved. And that was deemed to be the same as another band of, 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 of features causing shearing of the cavities. Now, in this case, what, you know, to cut it to, to, to cut to the chase, this could be caused by a twin or some other shear transformation. And this is something that was there potentially before the before the uh, irradiation. And it's diff geometrically inconceivable that these things could be the two, two, one and the same thing. This is parallel with the 111 plane, and this is curved. Hard to say. Um, so this is this lower feature has been shown by Jason to be a complex agronomy of platelets. So we're we're good to go. But the upper feature here is more of a twin structure because of the way it distorts the cavities. So one other factor that's that's popular nowadays is is a thing called uh, channel fracture, and um, it's been noted in steels uh, irradiated in EBR two, and it's basically in a material which is erstwhile uh, ductile in its fracture behavior at high doses you can end up with flat um, facets which are not on the grain boundaries but within the grains um, and and this has been dubbed channel fracture now when this was observed by uh, people like frank garner and that he also observed they also observed the shearing of the cavities and they they related the two. They said, oh, this and this we see in the same material, and therefore they're the same thing. They, they're an indication of the same thing. But just as we have here, there are two features which shouldn't be conflated. This is one thing, and this is something else. So Ghana basically said that this and this were related. However, other work has shown that the shearing is the result of twinning. But if you read the, the text here, Ghana makes the point that there is 100 to 200% shear in this particular case, and therefore, how can that be a twin? Well, not necessarily one twin, but it can be two twins or three twins, because if you have it at a at a free surface or in a microtensile test, there's no limit to the amount of twinning you can have in the same volume. So that is not an argument to say that this could not be twinning. I don't know what it is. But again, it's one of those in instances where somebody sees something, attributes it to something that they imagine might be the case and kind of make this very weak uh, link between the two. And there's really no reason without providing any proof. Uh, in this other case, this is work from Oak Ridge. I'm pretty convinced they work with Jim Bentley. He was a former Birmingham graduate. And I'm pretty sure if they said that this was twinning, uh, then it was twinning. So what can be causing this channel fracture? Well, in the same material that Garner talked about the channel fracture, they looked at one grain and they saw a lot of platelets and and they actually defined them described them as epsilon mountain site and that would be certainly uh sites uh, along the boundaries with the matrix where you could get fracture similar things have been observed this is a picture from puyan uh, chengisian um showing in this case, twins in uh, epsilon in sorry in X in Kinel X 750. So we have these similar kind of platelet features, which are in essence, whether they're twins or whether they're epsilon Martin site, they're inhomogeneities. They're 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 blockages to the continual 
sheer deformation of the material. And therefore, why not be sites of fracture? Other examples that Ghana uh, cited to support channel fracture, bizarrely, <laughs> is this one, um, which shows kind of cracking along, a, I guess, a string of cavities. I'm sorry, uh, carbides, I can only imagine. But of course, if you have carbides you and you have some bubble formation on the carbides, you, you're also going to get some easy cracking along that, that, in, that in that region. And he also had this, and he said that this was along grain boundaries, but he said it wasn't on the boundary, but these higher density of cavities were displaced from the boundary, which totally didn't make any sense. Again, uh, I think people are not being held to, to uh, strict enough, stringent requirements and said, well, you say that, you say one thing, but prove it, you know. And Sorry, Malcolm, get away. just um, a quick question. The uh, well, more of a technical thing. You're on yeah. on slide seventy four, correct? Oh, seventy seven. Sorry. Well, it's just that the um, yeah, right now your presentation is still synced to fifty seven somehow. Oh, uh, okay. I've gone back to seventy four right now. Are we out of sync for some reason? It seems so. It's okay. So you can just tell us which slide you're at, and the students can click to the appropriate slide. OK. Oh, I'm sorry about that. No, no uh, problem. Slide 77. Apologies. That's a glitch in the system, I guess. Yeah, I think it's teams helping helping out. <laughs> oh, OK, <laughs> okay I, so I'm, I'll move on from 77 um, uh, just to illustrate basically how Cracking is uh, helped by having inhomogeneities, in this particular case, carbides. I'm on slide 78 now. Um, and if these carbides also have some bubble formation, that, that only can help assist this, this cracking phenomenon. So just to illustrate, um, one of the other things about cracking and void formation, ductile cracking, is that um, it would always puzzle me about about um, people talk about microvoid coalescence and what they're actually talking about. Well, what they're actually talking about is that first first off, you get a crack, and that crack might occur at the interface with a carbide or some other inhomogeneity and at high stresses because of the incompatibility between the matrix, which is deforming, and the the particle which is not so you know if it's especially if it's an intermetallic it could be very very hard and therefore you have the possibility especially if you have some chemical uh inhomogeneity at the interface for a crack to form and when the crack forms if you then get subsequent deformation this crack will grow in into a void it will it will it will fan and it will extend and that's a ductile mechanism of of um ductile uh, failure, um, void formation and, and microvoid coalescence. As we, yeah, that's something I can't even go forward now. Okay, um, so I'm moving on now to slide 79. And this is my last section. I mean, I've got another 10, 10 or so slides to go through in 20 minutes. Um, I just described, sorry, it was disrupted because I was talking about one slide and you were looking at another one. I was talking about ductile failure, their mechanisms of ductile failure. And in order, and, and also to talk about, I was also talking about this thing called channel fracture, which is potentially failure along the interface um, of basically Epsilon Martin site or, or some other, could be eta phase. I mean, it is well known that eta phase in P16 and in um, uh, actually X750 as well, um, it is site for low energy failure. And the same thing in Inconel 718 is the delta phase. Anyway, when you have these large platelet-like particles, 
you can get you often see easier cracking and cracking associated with the interface with these particles. Now I'm going to move on to helium embrittlement, which is in a way related because if you get helium accumulation on the boundaries of these inhomogeneities, that's only going to assist in the cracking. This is just a picture of uh, Inconel 600 that came from this guy, um, Bill Whiffen. It's um, from Oak Ridge. And the little little light layers here are the ligaments between the cavities. You're, we're looking at a fracture surface, and the darker areas here are, oh, what the hell is going on here? Something happened there. I think I... Uh, are you still there? We We're are, but your presentation no longer is. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to. Yeah, I've lost it as well. OK, it's back. Yeah, but but where are we back to? Um, so Flight I'm gonna. Number one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna try and how do I get quickly to? Uh, how do I quickly get to some other? I want to go to somewhere else. Oh, there we go. My computer's not cooperating here. Sorry, I'm just trying to resurrect this thing. Try another one, another route. Can't display content. Apologies. Give me a minute. <sighs> maybe while we're so, maybe a quick question for you. Do you want to go through the rest of the slide, or do you want to move to maybe questions while we still have you with us? Yeah, OK, well, I, I'll you can ask questions now and I'm just going to flip through this. I there used to be a, a. A way I could. Well, now I can do it. My computer's freezing. Well, if anybody has a question, shoot. Damn it. And, uh, any questions? I don't like this. It's not. Uh, it's not cooperating. Well, I think I mean, maybe um, I don't know what the other option is, whether we can get a hold of the file and, and look at the slides ourselves. Um, rather than trying to go through it. Um, well, I mean, if if I think if you just ask some questions right now, and I'll just I'll just keep navigating forward. Okay, that works. There used to be a, a little button which would allow me to jump, but I I can't find it. I mean, it's not working. Anyway, so are there any questions? I only have like 10 slides left, but uh, are there any other questions? Any questions? Nope. Sorry, go ahead. There was somebody who was trying to speak, but it was a bit broken up. I can't hear anybody. Maybe everybody's on mute. Yeah, no, there, there was somebody was trying to speak, but it was um, 
it didn't come through very clearly. Yeah, I. This is frustrating. That's very polite. So um, maybe, well, if 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 um about the helium stuff. So maybe I'll ask a question. I mean, it's, this is more about getting your opinion about some. Um, there's like some recent MD from. I don't know. Are you familiar with uh, Mike Benkowitz? Did like a, 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 a some MD maybe a couple of years ago, where yeah. he shows this this sort of dull to brittle transition. In, yeah. In, in, so do you think it? it we this we is commissioned him to do that. Sorry. We commissioned him to do that. Yeah. So do you think so? This result about this uh, ductile to brittle transition. Do you think that actually uh, has a um, implications for for the uh, uh, the way fracture propagates in different conditions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one possibility. I mean, other people have different opinions about what's important. Um, and we're having a bit of a battle with people at Chalk River right now about their. If, can you see slide 80? Yes. OK. So this illustrates what happens when you have. Um, I, I'm, I'm still answering your question, but this illustrates what happens when you have no helium, but you can still have swelling. Or and if you do have helium, helium stabilizes cavities on grain boundaries, and that's essentially what you get in spaces. Now, for for various reasons, political mostly, um, the staff at Chalk River decided that this kind of buildup, perforation of helium bubbles on boundaries was not relevant to spaces. Well, I, I wouldn't say not relevant, but they said it was not the main reason for, for the failure. And that's still under debate, and we can still um, discuss that. Uh, and, and one of the reasons for, for that kind of statement coming from Chalk River had to do with that the images I showed earlier about the, the slip band and the cracking along a slip band, which wasn't a slip band, but it's actually a, a, a complex agglomeration of twin uh, and martensite platelets. So um, I, I believe, yes, that, that what Demkowitz did um, makes sense. Um, and as I say, we're, we're the next slide I'll just show you now will help make that make that clear. Here's uh, an example of a stress strain curve in a vanadium. It's a steel, it's essentially a stainless steel. It's 15 chrome, so it's stainless. Um, but it's it's imagine the, the vanadium is, is iron. It's the same thing. But this is a ferritic material now irradiated in FFTF at 520 degrees C. And you'll notice that the um, it's the classic picture of a helium embrittlement. You get this reduction in ductility and increase in strength, which is the normal radiation effect. But with helium, you also get, um, apart after the hardening, you also get from the helium, you get a, a reduction in the, a weakening and a reduction in ductility. So the thing breaks at a much lower stress and at a very low uh, strain. And that's associated in this particular case, in this particular instance, that failure there was associated with this with this kind of cavity accumulation on grain boundaries. And we see the same thing, a little bit messier, but we still see the kind of cavity nucleation in, on grain boundaries. And for spaces, we see the same kind of behavior, that we have this increase in strength and reduction in ductility, uh, which from a parsimony principle, the very first thing that you're going to hypothesize is that, oh, that is probably helium embrittlement. But again, there's some pushback on that. And we commissioned Mike to, to do this work and ask him, you know, like, what's the magic number? <laughs> and he worked out that around about 20%, uh, your, your fracture toughness drops to zero. Well, near enough. So you, you don't have to have much um, helium bubble coverage. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't realize that my question you were literally going to answer one slide later. <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. OK. 
So Mike, Mike, when asked what the mechanism was of the 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 embrittlement of the failure, um, Mike said he didn't know. He said he, he puts in molecular dynamics and he, it just failed in those ligaments. But this is the way I see it. You know, if you have a crack in a boundary, I don't know if you can see my pointer here. If you have a crack in a boundary, normally if it's a ductile crack, it's it's going to blunt. You're going to get slip and it's going to broaden and it's going to blunt. However, if you have cavities decorating the boundary, that blunting, that slip from the tip of the crack is going to be interrupted by the cavity and you'll get some opening crack, you know, it'll add to the crack opening if you like, uh, and then it'll transfer the the deformation along it. And it's just an easier way to progress this, this cracking. I'm not saying that that's the true way the thing's happening, but it's easy to see and it's it's a semi-ductile kind of pseudo, uh, we're on slide 84, by the way, on a pseudo um, brittle, it's pseudo ductile, pseudo brittle kind of failure. It's just localized because of the cavities. So um, one of the arguments that was raised by people at Chalk River said, well, yeah, how'd you get the crack? And I said, well, the cracking starts on these things at the surface and, and uh, I mean, you tell me if the surface is pristine and, and beautiful. I don't know. I imagine the surface is, is quite um, quite damaged. You know. Anyway, so this is how I, I see the, the situation uh, in terms of dose with spaces. If you if you if you look at the uh, stress strain behavior and you think about the yield strength. I showed you how the yield strength changed because of the dissolution of the gamma prime precipitates. Uh, so what you get is at low doses, the material yields, and then eventually it'll fail, but in a ductile manner at the same point as the ultimate tensile strength. But what happens when you get helium embrittlement, it might yield, still yield, but it'll fail at the grain boundaries because the grain boundary strength, because of because of this, it's easier to then crack along the boundaries. And then if ultimately what's the thing that everybody's looking for in terms of the uh, the joint project, the concern is, is will it eventually get to the point where it'll fail um, in a brittle manner? And do we need a grain boundary crack to initiate? So, <sighs> There's a lot of other work uh, that's been reported on back in 2005 on stainless steels. This is flux thimbles, where they showed some degree of embrittlement at 625 APPM. And the speculation was that this embrittlement was related in the case of this flux thimble, 316 stainless steel, with this cavity um, alignment along the boundaries. And I think that's a reasonable hypothesis and, and, and may may be true, may not be, and that's 625 APPM. Bear in mind that with our spacers in candy reactor, this number here is 30,000 APPM. <laughs> so is it any surprise that we get uh, embrittlement? So one of the things I noticed in preparing this, this lecture was um, the other thing, aspect that I'm not touching on is stress corrosion cracking. And one of the other things that's have been of interest in the US is, oh, we get this chromium depletion. Sorry. We get this chromium depletion in um, at the grain boundaries. And there's a guy called Brummer and Gary Watts and company, and they did a lot of work showing that this chromium depletion happens during irradiation. Now, that might be because you get an extra carbide precipitation, but it could also happen if you're getting a, a sink. So if you have a sink, along a boundary, uh, a sink for vacancies. Chromium is a fast diffuser relative to all the other elements. So you're gonna get a depletion of chrome because it's gonna diffuse in the opposite direction to the vacancies. So it's essentially a radiation enhanced diffusion. Oh man. I think I've got, um, I think I'm, not showing all of the the images. I don't know why. I'm I'm on slide 87. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. 
So anyway, I, I, I enhanced the contrast <laughs> of Brummer's image and I'm thinking, holy crap, it looks like he's got a string of voids there. And that would then make total sense, you know. So, I mean, they, they were kind of hand waving about what's going on. There's some weird combination of interstitial and vacancy diffusion and other, I'll be, I, 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 even though they said it was inverse Kirkendall, there was no reason for it. Do you know what I mean? There was no, I mean, you, you could say, well, we get flux, vacancy flux to grain boundaries, but then you'd expect to see some evidence and they never talked about it. But this segregation goes hand in hand with embrittlement. So when it comes to stress corrosion cracking, what's more important? Is it the chromium depletion or the fact that you've got this high density of cavities on the boundary? Or is it both? You know. So anyway, that's just a throwaway item I, I noticed when I was putting this together. And so I don't seem to be able to. I've, I'm looking at slide eight, trying to get slide 88 here, and I can't, yeah, I don't that's, see that's it. that's what we're looking at. Uh, Malcolm, yeah, I'm just but, aware that it's two o'clock, and you said you had to, yeah, to close no, it yeah. too. So uh, then I, I'll finish in five minutes, and I'll just go by my little images at the bottom of the screen here. This is the first image of um, cavities along grain boundaries and spaces. Um, this shows what I was going to talk about there about chromium depletion. Oh yeah, I can see it now. Oh, interesting. Um, so the, the thing is about why chromium diffusion is important because it, you can lead to an intergranular attack. And then this is another piece of work by Was and company. And they, they looked at chromium depletion in steels as a function of dose. Um, they started off at what is the nominal chromium content of the material, and this is at the brand green boundary. And again, so what this tells me is that they're starting out with a non-sensitized material. So you, you don't have any carbide precipitation, nothing to deplete the chromium to begin with. It, it's, at the, it's at the optimum levels that you have in your alloy, the beginning. And then they irradiate, and then they, they see a, a drop in the chromium depletion. But this, anyway, in this particular case, they can call it, you know, this is a, they called it a radiation induced effect, but I think it's more a radiation enhanced effect. Because if you um, look at the enhancement of radiation, you're getting up to very high equivalent temperatures during the radiation. And in this particular case, again, this is a, something that, you might want to consider as a as a follow up uh, research project at Queens. There was a guy called Fournier, the same guy who who looked at <laughs> at gamma prime and disappearing and called it slip. Um, the the same guy they did some work again with Gary Watson Company, and they looked at this chromium depletion at grain boundaries and the effect of alloying elements, and they added hafnium, and they called it a spectacular effect that in adding hafnium, they suppressed all the chromium depletion at grain boundaries. But I think what they failed to recognize is that hafnium is a carbide former. So just like I said earlier, that um, mechanical engineers or metallurgists add things like niobium, molybdenum um, to steels in order to prevent the chromium depletion because they're carbide formers and they'll form carbides preferentially to the chrome. These guys are seeing something which could obviously be the same thing because hafnium is also a carbide former. And what they could be looking at is, is something which is not exactly a, a radiation induced effect. So I think they're not thinking far enough in, in these particular cases. So again, that's that may be something that Queens could probably follow up on. And then my last Could I make a, a quick uh, comment slash question about this? Yeah. So if you go to slide 90, the, um, I, I can see that the, um, like the chromium concentrations we're dealing with are, are under the percolation threshold to a large extent. Or like which is at the like almost 25% in FCC materials. 
So what that means is, is to me, is, is when the, the vacancies are, and you're right, like they will preferentially go through the chromium subsystem, but they don't percolate. So there will also be some some nickel doing kind of this this doing this as well. So what my thinking is 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 you also have the self interstitials that actually we, we did these calculations and and they will go through the nickel subsystem and push nickel towards the grain boundary. So it's quite uh, my my view here is there's a big possibility that this isn't just vacancy mediated, but the self interstitials might also be pushing the nickel towards the, the gray boundary. Oh, um, yeah, I mean. I, I, and that, that might, that would probably be a big, I mean, the fact that you're under the percolation threshold does um, does suggest that. And what do you mean by the percolation threshold? Um, like if you're on an FCC lattice, if you if you sit on a certain chromium site, you need to, for, in order to be able to reach a gray boundary, you need to have um, you know, it, you need to have like a, a, a an undisturbed path of chromium. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck also jumping on nickel sites, which is me, which means that then you start, uh, you're not going to get enrichment. Or oh, yeah, no, I, I, the, the, you, I mean, is, you can yeah. also take you can also take a step back here and just say what do you observe? You you, you, you typically uh, quite quite apart from the preferential carbide formation, um, chromium. The self diffusion of chromium, if you just think about thermal self diffusion, the self diffusion of chromium is faster than the, the other the other elements. So if you have nickel, that's correct. That's exactly right. So if you're above the percolation threshold, it's only gonna you're gonna have basically only diffusion on the chromium subsystem, and then you'll have massive depletion. But yeah. when you go under that, and this is something this. We made these calculations quite a bit, and they we've been able to to um, ask actually Ian Robertson's group to go and look at this, and it seems to be correct. Once you go under that magic number, the um, um, you, you seem to um, to get a lot less de vacancy mediated de de depletion, which we think then in this case might mean, and in fact, it's an in it might be a self interstitial mediated mechanism. Yeah, and 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 that magic number is what. But it's in FCC material. It's I think twenty two and a half. Oh, okay. Well, okay. But I mean, this depletion you see here, you'll also get thermally. Um, just because you you're getting carbide formation, and that's again, uh, yeah, yeah, the that's combination. So I'm, I I think that's right, and I'm I'm just saying this might be um yeah this is like a a, a, a probably another element that might. It's like another mechanism that can, can be quite substantial. I mean, we can discuss this at, at some point. I'll show you. This is a lot of work that Yuri Sitsky and I did. Okay, well, I mean, okay, so what I would take from that is that that supports the notion that this depletion is from carbide formation because you can't necessarily explain it based on this percolation threshold because you're below that percolation threshold. So you're depleting the chromium anyway and 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 because you're below the your percolation threshold, you've got a you've got another mechanism that's potentially that's possible. But the, the point is that the, that the grain boundary also serves as a sink for the self interstitials, which them actually carry whatever they're diffusing on with them instead of in the opposite direction. Yeah. No. I. Uh, anyways, I, that's a. I mean, we can have the. I think this is a. Yeah. This is a. Something we probably want to uh, discuss at some point because you're right. Like, and when you say this is something Queens should look into, I think you're exactly right. It's it's a pretty interesting problem. But but again, what I what I want to emphasize here is this kind of effect. They didn't see it when they added hafnium. Mm -hmm. Now, what's that got to do <laughs> with self diffusion? <laughs> that I, I mean, think you're quite I, right. I think I think there are there are two things that are going on. Uh, um, one is the inverse Kirkendall diffusion type and interstitial diffusion um, coupling, uh, that kind of thing. But there is also the carbide formation. And which one is, which one is important, or, or is any important? I don't know. Uh, but but um, I, I I I I look at what's been reported, and I'm, I kind of think, eh, you know, you haven't discussed it. I mean, they haven't used the magic words, and they haven't mm -hmm. said we considered this or we we looked for this, and none of that comes out in in how they describe things. So I'm, 
remain then skeptical. So if you guys are doing some work on it, great. Yeah. So I, Mark did say, as Mark said, I, I've got to get, because uh, I have to, um, I've got a, a COG meeting here. So I think I was almost there. Yeah, that was the last one. And that was the summary. So there was a cock up there. Sorry, excuse my language. Uh, in the presentations, um, both with both with the videos, but also we got out of sync there. And I don't know. I have no idea what that's causing that. But uh, Mark, uh, I think we'll. We'll be in the recording and see 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 what was out of sync on the recording. OK, sounds good. And um, yeah, thanks very much, Mark. I really appreciate it. Uh, if anybody has questions, um, that they'd like to to send to Malcolm. Um, I'm sure he would be uh, be willing to to entertain, and and uh, he's also uh, visits fairly uh, frequently uh, to Queens, so there'll be other opportunities to to uh, meet and interact with him. So, thank you very mm -hmm. much, Malcolm. Really appreciate it, and um, we'll let you go. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, so um, at this 